What up, everybody? It's the pregame show. The pregame show with Aslan and Corey. Okay. Right. It's the, this is the show before the show starts. we got all these Renegade Express questions to get to, Corey. Uh, but we should talk a little bit about basketball before we get to that, and then we'll do some maybe a little bit longer towards the end of it. I don't know why I sound this way. I should be a lot more enthusiastic. Florida State wins 73-72 to over Purdue and, and come from behind uh, fashion. What's like one of the, what's the one thing you, you sort of take away from this game? Um, they stole it, I thought. Oh, uh, don't uh, say that. No, they didn't. I don't mean that as a negative. I mean, sometimes it's fun to steal games. I, I thought Purdue probably, with the way they played the first 15 minutes of that second half, deserved to win that game. And um, then they made some really boneheaded mistakes. Their best player missed a couple free throws, kept turning it over. And give credit to Florida State, they locked it down when they had to. They played really well. And I will say one thing, the crowd – for mm-hmm. like, I, mean, I think the, it ended at like 11.45 at night, somewhere yeah. around there. That crowd was insane. Like, they yeah. were really into it for a, a game in November. So was President John Thrasher. Did he you see the video posted? Yeah. yeah, man. So, um, you know, Florida State basketball game in November, not against like a Duke or a, uh, I don't know, uh, North Carolina. ACC or Big Ten Challenge, though, brother. Well, I know. People got a lot of pride right down here about winning three in a row of these things now. But, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that was my takeaway is the – the final four minutes, Florida State played really well defensively, got a, got a few breaks. One that they didn't get because I thought they Purdue immediately turned it over on that one play and they said that they didn't, mm-hmm. and then they forced the jump ball right after that anyway. And then Trent Forrest is, does what he does, man. That's just at the end of games, he's he gets in the lane, he makes plays. Yeah, the kid's really good. Uh, what's better than good is great. Following now will be a great show. It's called Wake Up War Chant. From Cali to Tally, it's time to wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source, and this is Wake Up Warchant. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hudjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What up, everybody? Showtime. Uh, One day hiatus, we're back. This will probably be the last show of the week, and that's because... Uh, your boy over here, Corey Clark, Corey S. Clark, he's playing hurt, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, he's going to tough it out for us here for the next, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. We'll try to make it quick. I'll probably do uh, most of the talking today, but Corey's here. He's hurt. Uh, we appreciate it, Corey. Y- you battling through this for us? I'm trying. I feel like we just lost a lot of listeners with you telling them beforehand that you're going to do most of the talking. Whatever, man. He's gotta... I know. It's a joke. It was a joke. You know people love you. And I love you more than anyone. <laughs> oh, I'm going to say anything to that. Uh, so we're going to do uh, everything today. We're going to do the phone calls, and we're going to do the Renegade Express. Um, just before we dive into that, we'll also have a recap of last night's Purdue-Florida State game. Don't want to talk about it right now. We're just going to focus on um, the football aspect of business here. Um, what a, a roller coaster of emotions for me, Corey, uh, logging on the war chant for the last 36 hours. Uh, Irish Chauffel just showing us um, why he is five-star Chauffel, why he is the, the best guy on the beat, just cranking out all sorts of great content. He started off with his 3-2-1, uh, sort of what Willie Taggart needs to do for the future. That kind of got me bummed out because there wasn't a lot of, you know, hellfire and brimstone coming from Ira, but that's not his thing. He's, he's, he's pragmatic. He's sensible Chauffel. And then he started speaking to George Henshaw. I haven't gotten to reading that part yet. From what I've heard, that's a very optimistic take uh, on how things are. Uh, things will be better. And then Ira just takes it to the top. He goes and speaks to John Thrasher, Florida State University president. And that's got me excited. That's kind of got the juices flowing. Uh, because ultimately, I, mean, I guess the crux of Ira's story, and we're not going to give it away, um, to the people who don't subscribe. You can join anytime you want, though, folks. Use the promo code WARCHANT30 over on WARCHANT.com and become part of the family. But the crux of it is basically John Thrasher uh, is hinting strongly that he's already spoken to Willie and it, it, they seem to be in agreement that there are changes need to be made on that coaching staff and Thrasher is going to provide the necessary support uh, to get the best sort of people into those spots. Uh, that's a good thing to hear, but I, I don't know, for some reason, hearing it come from the president, uh, he says, you know, changes, plural. There's got to be more than just like David Kelly getting moved to an in-house position and Alonzo Hampton following him. Like, there needs to be more than that, right, Corey, or else what are we really changing? Well, I mean, you know, you, you're ho- you're hopefully improving your special teams, which is a big part of football. Right, right. Um, 
I, I that that's a big deal. And um, yeah, I you know I don't know exactly what kind of changes will be made. I can't put a I can't put a finger on. I can't get a pulse. Uh, I can't get a feel for it. Um, you know, we talked about on headlines on on Tuesday that again I brought it like I brought up with you. Like you know, there's nothing that says you have to have a full time special teams coach, and maybe you figure out what your biggest weakness is on this football team or what you think is your biggest weakness and bring in somebody to coach that better. And then they can also, you can divvy up special teams however you want. Like Charles Kelly in 13 was linebackers slash special teams. And they had un- incredible special teams in 2013. Hey, bring Charles Kelly back as a special teams guy. Whatever you got to do, you got to get better in that role. But I also think you can do it by maybe bringing in a, a quarterback, a secondary coach. You know, I, I, you know, we, we mentioned Terrell Buckley. That's a guy that obviously bleeds guarded in gold, um, has a daughter that I believe is on the golf team here. Um, obviously one of the best to ever play here and he's good at what he does. He's the secondary coach of Mississippi state and they've been really good defensively oh, yeah. the last couple of years. So maybe just by osmosis, you bring in somebody like a Terrell Buckley who has seen how Mississippi state has devised defenses and they were really good defensively, right? This year, Mississippi state. Oh yeah. They're passing. Yeah, and so especially. even if you're, he's not the defensive coordinator, obviously, but he can bring some ideas, um, which wouldn't be a bad thing. I don't think for Harlan Barnett and those guys to get some, um, some ideas from a de- from a guy on a defense that played really well in 2018 and 2017. Um, and again, that's just me spitballing, but that's the kind of thing you might be looking at. It's not just let's replace the special team, let's fire a special teams coach, let's let's move a receivers coach. Maybe you uh, completely recalibrate your staff. That would be cool, but I wasn't expecting that after reading Iris three two one. It seemed to well, be but very- you can't like you're not going to get rid of hard. You're not like getting rid of a coordinator, but. You know, I also think there's something where you could say where Willie Taggart could just say it's Walt Bell's offense, and that's yes. that. Yes, yes. You that's know, I, I, and let him. If you believe in this guy, if you think he's one of the bright young minds in college football, and people thought that going into that, going into this past season, um, and he had the track record at least at Arkansas State. Now Maryland never did anything, but they were always on their ninth quarterback. Um, you know, if you think he's a bright offensive coordinator, loosen the reins and let him go. Let him do it. And see what he can do. Let him let him game plan. Let him design, and let him call plays. But I, I don't know if Willie Taggart's going to take that uh, that biggest step in his first off season, first true off season. Well, that that's the problem. Then I mean, I, I, my my concern is that I think the idea was floated out for Harlan to have a DB sort of coach or a safeties coach to help him out in the secondary, and he didn't want that. He he wanted to be the DC, and he wanted to control. And I don't mean control like in a, in a bad way, but he wanted to be the guy that would preside over defensive backs. So, I mean, he said no the first time around. I mean, I guess maybe Willie forces his hand a little bit more this time around and says that, you know, these changes have to be made. Harlan maybe is more receptive to it this time around, hopefully. But, yeah, again, offensively, if, if you're only going to really – Well, when you're, but when you're trying to hire Harlan Barnett and he gives you that as one of the stipulations, I think you're like, okay, you can do that. But after the year they just had where they gave up 32 points a game – and got completely obliterated in like three of their last four games. Maybe Harlan Barnett doesn't have, uh, he doesn't have a big podium to stand on right now. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and it's Willie's pro, it's Willie's program. And if Willie wants to change, make a change, Willie needs to make a change. It, the question is, what does he think needs to be changed? And I, I, I think that's what obviously we'll find out over the next six weeks. Right. But then back to the offensive side of things, I think that's probably the best case is that he just maybe sits back and lets Walt handle everything because again if, if it's only going to be David Kelly who leaves uh, and, and by leave I mean moves from uh, on the practice field to inside the the football op center and that kind of stuff uh, then then what really changes I mean how I mean this is a five and seven football team and I'm not saying blow the whole thing up but you have to make significant changes that didn't look to me like an offense where you're like hey man just uh, bring Ron Dugans in and this thing will turn around like lickety split I mean I know receivers came out there and and looked sort of lost on several occasions throughout the season. But I don't know how much that is plays not being called in the, in, in the right amount of time and, and, and it being communicated properly to David Kelly and then to the receivers. So I don't want to put it all on David Kelly. Uh, but again, I, I just think I would hope that these changes that, that John Thrasher intimated in the conversation with Ira uh, Schofel, our managing editor, uh, do include things that either are going to free the reins on a, on a Walt Bell perhaps or at least bring in some defensive back help. Um, and obviously special teams, that's something I think we can all agree on has to be fixed. So that, that's, that's without saying. So, yeah. And again, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I don't, I don't know that they will be announcing anything before, um, 
the first signing day on what I think that's like December 18th or 19th or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, we won't know really what Willie Taggart pegged as the biggest weaknesses of this team until we see these changes. But I think we all thought and assumed there'd be changes made, but John Thrasher coming out and basically uh, assuring the fans, like it's not the best timing for it because you are recruiting and you have these assistants on the road recruiting. And now a recruit might be like, Hey man, are you going to be here? You're like, who am I, who am I committing to? Who's right. going to be my receivers coach? Um, who's going to be my own line coach? Who's going to be my linebackers coach? Whatever, whoever's asking those questions, if they're getting rid of some guys, that's not the that's not the ideal time to float out there that you're changing your staff. But John Thrasher is not all that concerned about a three or four star linebacker from this place or a nope. lineman from that place. Nope. He's uh he's kind of concerned about keeping money. Yeah. And keeping interest and getting money. And so Thanks. you have to go out there and let people know that changes are coming. I know Willie Taggart doesn't want to do that, but Florida State fans are restless and panicking. So just to calm them down, I think it's good overall for the Florida State program to let people know, okay, changes are definitely coming. Yeah. Fix it, please, Willie. Uh, early signing period starts December 19th. There you go. So, All right. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and uh, let's hop on this pony, brother. Uh, or brother, rather, not butter. That'd be kind of weird. That'd be really, that'd be really weird. Um, oh, by the way, Paul Johnson's retiring. Uh, good night, sweet prince. It was a great, great run. It was. It was. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna miss. I'm gonna miss that. I'm gonna miss three yards and a cloud of, uh, you know, grimacing. Georgia love, Tech. Lo- love him on the sideline. Georgia Tech sleeping giant. No, no. They're they're always gonna be second fiddle in that state. Um, I am interested to see what they can do. Uh, I mean, they they had a nice little. You know, people for they had Calvin Johnson, Demarius Thomas too. Yeah, yeah. They had some really good players and uh, some good defensive players through the years. And then that, you know, obviously that offense makes it hard to recruit anyone. They, they got nothing but two and three stars essentially for the last decade. Now, he did all right with those guys, but you're allowed to recruit four and five star kids. And I think they'll get a few of them. But, yeah, they're not going to beat Georgia in many head to head recruiting battles. Yeah. Some of the more interesting names I've already seen out there. Neil Brown from Troy and then uh, Ken Wisenhunt, of all people, uh, former offensive coordinator for the Steelers, head coach of the Cardinals. I think he was the head coach of the Cardinals when they lost in the Super Bowl to the Steelers. Don't quote me on that. Anyhow, uh, to the mailbag. Matty the Knoll, what do you think was the cause of the lack of discipline this year, and how do we get it fixed? I do not mind losing to superior teams, but I get frustrated when self-inflicted wounds, procedure penalties, too few players on the field are the cause. But what causes this? I am not a football savant, nor have I ever played, but these issues that plagued us all year seem like coaching 101. Well, yeah, what do you well, mean? Yeah, by that's lack what of I was going to say is they weren't coached very well. Yeah, the lack of discipline there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if did you say it? Did did we talk about it at the uh the war chant dinner that we had over at Shula Steakhouse the other night? Shout out to the boss man Gene Williams. Fantastic little night. Uh we ate like kings. How was your ribeye by the way? My ribeye was solid. solid. Yeah, mine was really good. So was that risotto, son? Oh, I know I should have got the risotto, but uh what with the man? smashed potatoes and the asparagus. I'm all about that asparagus. I don't know if like Iris said it over dinner, but I I think you know um you know Willie kind of had I don't know if Willie tried to walk the line in terms of trying to install new uh, a new mindset, but also having to kind of be mindful that he's the new guy. A lot of these guys didn't obviously sign up to play for him, so you, you kind of have to curry favor and win these kids over. So he was stuck in that that difficult position. I don't know how much of the discipline is just him maybe not being able to fully go with what he wants to do, how he wants to be, because he knows he has some fragile egos and, uh, you know, as he said, mentally weak players. I mean, I guess that does ultimately fall back onto a coaching thing, uh, but that could be some sort of element or uh, dynamic at play. But, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, that that's – I guess that's that's got to be partly coaching, but, I mean, players need to take accountability too. If you see a guy out there goofing around and kicking a field goal, dude, what are you doing? Like, get your ass in the locker room. Or, like, go run a route. What do you want scholarship here to do? Go do that, buddy. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's never just one thing, but at the end of the day, it's his program, it's his team, and they were dead last in the nation in number of penalties. Um, so, you know, that's on you, and that's on the way you coach your coaches, the way they practice, and then obviously the way they execute. But it's not it's not just one thing, but we certainly can't blame it all on the coaches. The players have to want to not screw up and actually pay attention to detail, but it just needs to be hammered home better, whatever you got to do 
just cut it from nine penalties a game to six. Yeah. You know, that that's all you're looking at. That's all you need to try to do. It's just like this team at no point felt like they had some sort of solid game plan that they were going to come out and execute and everyone knew what they had to do on a given play. You know, there's, I guess, maybe like the opening drive against Northern Illinois, uh, maybe the opening drive against Wake. Like they had their moments, but it just felt like this team and all these tempo teams that run the spread and all that kind of RPO stuff, so much feed on momentum and going fast. And it felt like whenever – Something didn't go according to plan. When that perimeter play on first and 10 turned into second and 14, there was just chaos ensued. Like there was just no resiliency in this team. Again, that's a mentality that, again, maybe it was instilled by Jimbo Fisher. A lot of you think that. Somebody even tweeted us the other day, Corey, 80% of the blame for this season they put on Jimbo. 80. 20 on Willie. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, Next question. Honey Fried Pickens. Hey, guys. Enjoy the show. With the worst season witnessed in many of our lives now over, how many coaching changes do you expect in the offseason? That we mentioned that kind of in the beginning of the program. I mean, give me three. I need like three guys, full-time dudes, uh, no longer being on the field. I need at least three. Two's not enough for me. Three's the magic number at least. Uh, I mean, I think that's what you're looking at, two or three. It's not, I don't think it's going to be half the staff. You're looking at like uh, two or three at, at most. Land Shark Knoll. Wake up, boys. Oh, who am I kidding? Now that the season's over, I'm sure neither of you have gotten out of bed before noon. Actually, I've been out of bed like at 1030 uh, the last few days. It's. I wasn't feeling great on luck. Wednesday morning, so I was more of like 1130 noonish. Okay. But uh, yeah, That's fine. That's it, fine. it's nice to not get up at 730. Yeah, I can tell you that. I don't know how you fools do it. Oh, by the way, uh, we're going to have Michael Ray Garvin, former Florida State uh, track and football great, on the program next week. And I reached out to him, Corey, and I was like, hey, we're, we got some time now to bring you on to talk about your book and what you've been up to. Uh, let me know what time uh, and what day works best for you. And he's, he's like, hey, what about 9 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday? And I'm like, ah, yeah, uh, so we, don't, we don't roll like that around here, MRG. We'd rather do 9 p.m. Yeah, yeah, so i got to get back to him and, and get that hammered out, so. Uh, here we go. Land Shark Knoll says, serious question. How many points a game do you think we average next season with our first ever quad OC with Walt Bell, Gus Malzahn, Cliff Kingsbury, and Larry Fedora? Can't wait. God bless the Knolls. God bless the Tribal Council. God bless Tervis Tumblers. And God bless America. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, offensive guys out there that, could, uh, that maybe old Willie could bring on board. You know, Walt Bell is from the Fedora tree. He is. So why why pick up one of the branches when you can have the whole tree? The whole trunk. Get the trunk. Just go get you could just go get old Larry Fedora to be your OC. Um I do think the offense will be better next year, but could it be worse? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, what Miles about- not leaving, by the way, is he? No, but they're supposedly trying to reduce his buyout. So I think he's owed, like, th- if they fired him tomorrow, he would be owed $32 million. So I think for him to stay there, uh, they're gonna they're trying to, which is crazy. He doesn't have to say yes to it. Um, but apparently, if he wants to stay there, he's going to have to take a reduced sort of guaranteed buyout if he were to get terminated. So uh, we'll see how that goes. That'd be kind of crazy uh, for once a, 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 some sort of sanity returning to college athletics. Yeah, I, yeah, I can't imagine. Why would he say, "Okay, we can reduce my buyout," just to keep the job? Like, yeah. I mean, where else? The money's the same no matter what, right? Right? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's leaves. that would be really weird on his part. But you know, you know, whatever, whatever. Well, I, it would be side. nice if these coaches, if these uh, dumb presidents, uh, rallied together and colluded with the, with each other. Just don't admit that you're colluding, and um. And stop this nonsense. Stop bidding, outbidding each other for the. I mean, just stop spending so much money on these coaches and always giving them, giving them these enormous buyouts. That's crazy. He beats Georgia, that was number one in the nation. He beats Alabama, who I think was then number one in the nation, and has a lead on um, Georgia seven to three. I want to say in the first quarter of the SEC championship game, and then his star running back goes down. And then the wheels come off. They lose to Georgia. They lose to uh, UCF in the bowl game. And then they, they're they 7-5 and five this year, and they want to fire him. Uh, but in the middle of all that, Arkansas, after the whole uh, Iron Do they bowl really want to fire him? Like, are Auburn fans clamoring to get someone better than him? Like, he's okay. What do they think they're going to get? Something better. 
Some I mean, he's he's had nice years, right? Only really two. Last season, which ended kind of with a thud, and then his first season. Otherwise, I don't think they've had double-digit wins other than those two seasons, 13 and then 17. Oh, all right. Well, you know. Auburn's it's a weird place. In that state. See, Auburn, like next year, is going to have no expectations on them. They'll probably they'll have this kid Malik Willis that'll be their quarterback, and like watch them sneak up on some people and win ten games. Like Auburn's like that. You know, they're they're the program that whenever expectations are high, they always, always, always fold. Uh, right. But when they have no expectations, they go out there and they surprise you, and then you're like, oh, Auburn's great, but they're really not. It's Auburn. Uh, by the way, the the God bless Tervis Tumblers thing. If that went over people's heads, which probably went over most of your heads. Some guy in the Tribal Council, after the Florida loss, said that he was over it. Uh, he was no longer supporting Florida State. He was getting rid of all of his shirts, no longer donating to the boosters, and he was also throwing away all of his Tervis tumblers. What is a Tervis tumbler? It's just like one of those, you know, cups, like a Yeti cup, like a like a plastic. It's like uh, I don't know. It's it keeps your drink a little bit colder than it, but it's like a clear plastic cup with like a lid. It's like, it's like an adult sippy cup, is what it really is. Oh, all right, it's an adult sippy cup. Uh, all right, next question. Enol underscore 2000. Yo, yo, guys. Yo, freaking yo. Corey asked the other day, who are we more upset with, Jimbo or Willie? Personally, I'm more upset with Jimbo because he left an absolute mess. With Willie, I'd say it's more of a, quote, head scratcher. I'm all for giving him more time, and I'm hoping he writes the ship, but it's definitely hard to stomach when you see a team look more confused and lost in game 12 than they were in game one. That's what concerns me most. I seriously began to question if they spent the week practicing or going to the mall and playing video games, which, if that's what they did, that would explain what we saw this year, but I'm pretty sure they didn't. Corey's article was literally spot on to how I was feeling, so good on you, sir, for the write-up. Oh, well, there you go. Thank you. Does it make you feel better, Corey? This all it like- does, yeah. It does. Like- and uh, somebody on the message board uh, yesterday brought up uh- – you know, calling out fans and media that Jameis was only Jimbo was only made on Jameis, and that Florida State was dumb for letting their Urban Meyer go. Um, number one, the comparison to Urban Meyer, which I pointed out in the thread, was bizarre. Urban Meyer, you know, Urban Meyer's lost nine games at Ohio State in seven years. He's lost nine games, and yeah. Jimbo's lost ten in eleven months. Now, I'm not saying Jimbo's not a good coach; he is. He's not Urban Meyer or Nick Saban. He's somewhere in between. You know, those guys and I don't know, less miles. He's somewhere in between those guys. Right now, he's certainly got a better resume, and nobody could argue that Willie. Ta- they think Willie Taggart is a better coach than Jimbo Fisher right now. But two things. Number one, they didn't fire Jimbo. Jimbo left. He was coming back, and they were building that facility for him, and they were giving him money for assistant coaches. And the thing, again, and I'll reiterate it, till the day I'm not talking here anymore on, on podcasts or writing stories, the fact that Jim only took two of those guys with him should anger every FSU fan because, gosh darn it, if they're not good enough for Texas A&M, then why were they good enough for Florida State? Right. Because that's where it went wrong. You had Bill Miller and Rick Trickett out there recruiting guys that don't belong at Florida State, quite frankly, or certainly haven't played up to that role yet. And they weren't coached well. They weren't developed. And now you're left with this. It's not all on Jimbo Fisher, man. I don't think Jimbo Fisher would have lost – six games by 20 points if he'd have been the coach here this year, but he's not, he left and he didn't leave a real good situation. So I get the anger on both sides, but it is, you know, they didn't let urban Meyer walk away. They let a pretty good coach walk away that had a a, a cut one great season, but he's a pretty good coach. And he's certainly proven a lot more than the, the guy that's currently at Florida state. By the way, I just saw, I, we people that don't know we uh we tape this sometimes not at five in the morning, um that Tim Brewster's leaving to go to North Carolina. No way, really. Leaving A and M to go to North Carolina. That's what it said. There, the North Carolina or the Texas A and M two four seven site. Hmm. He's headed to North Carolina to be the tight ends coach for uh, Mac Brown. Yeah, can't hang, man. Brewster's a weird guy. I covered Brewster at Mississippi State. I wasn't a fan. I remember when Jimbo hired him. I'm like, really? We hired this guy. Um. Well, and he was the recruiting coordinator, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can't look at this roster and say that the recruiting coordinator for 15, 16, and 17 did a bang-up job. You just can't. So, anyway, good luck in North Carolina. At least they'll be an ACC fan again. I'm not going to relitigate this because I'm sure at some point in March. Oh, we don't, I was just uh, bringing it up because it was on the message boards. Yeah, but, I mean, I got to defend my guy's honor, but I won't today. 
Uh, national Thanks, champs. Buddy. Well, 99. nothing I said was wrong. You don't disagree with anything I said. Um, I said he's a good coach. That's what you think. I and mean, you know he's not Urban Meyer. So we're on the same page. I think he's a great coach. Uh, national champs 99. Yo, guys. He did, that, he did that in all caps with two exclamation marks. All right. Uh, not that I mark out to you guys or anything, but I couldn't help but take a screenshot of the great Corey Clark showing his press pass to FSU security live on ABC. Forgive me if this has been sent to you. Uh, there's a screenshot, Corey, of the telecast that has you uh, showing a, a, what looks like your press pass to one of the sports information directors that was on the sideline. They have a smile oh, on, their on face. Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, because I didn't have the uh, lanyard thing. Right. So she was just, it was, uh, I think it was Kristen, Krista, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, she was making, she was like, where's your pass? And I was just showing her that it was in my pocket right. because it had, I had lost my lanyard. Nice. Uh, Florida mom, FL mom 777. Corey and Aslan, hindsight's 2020. Given the way the season went, do you think it was better for Taggart to go buddy buddy system coach or scorched earth? Thank you for your help getting through this off season. Oh, we've just started though. We've just started. We only and by the way, Corey, I'm still in denial. I'm still in denial that that, that what happened happened. A friend of mine. Okay, well that's good. You still haven't moved on to acceptance. Yeah, not at all. Um, a friend of mine like showed us like this, you know, uh, very crudely created meme, very amateur, uh, of this guy coming out of a sewer, and he had like a, a Florida tattoo imp- superimposed on him and said. Uh, Florida Gator fans uh, reemerging after five years of silence. You know, uh, sure. And I'm just like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Why would they come back out? I mean, they, you know, why would they come back out? They lost five years on a row to us. Right. Um, yeah. And, sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. All right. So uh, was it better for Taggart to go buddy, buddy system uh, with his coaching staff or, I don't know, or, or scorched earth, or I guess buddy, buddy system as the head coach, like your friendly coach or scorched earth. I mean, this was the this was the thing that I had my concerns with at the beginning of the year uh, when we first started doing this show together. It's just I I don't know. I just feel and listen. I've never been in a, in a football locker room, but I've I've been around the game long enough that I think there's there's just a certain tone and tenor you need to have to to get across the kids and to have them uh, you know uh, execute game plans and and to be successful players. That I don't know. I mean, I feel like I don't. But I don't know if a drill sergeant would have been the best thing, considering what Jimbo was beforehand. It, it felt like Willie was was the right sort of elixir. I don't know. Um, but I would defer usually to guys that are jerks, because uh, I can uh, I can you know sympathize with them more. Yeah, I, I again, I, I think well, it wasn't obviously hindsight for the 2018 season. Whatever he did, he shouldn't have done. Um, but. You know, you don't want to. You don't want somebody to change who they are. That's who he is. And again, you know, we know he's in a different place now. But he believes in how he believes in his approach, and it's worked. So, you know, it doesn't work right away. That's the thing. And maybe the scorched earth guys work quicker. But by year three or by year four, when they're really buying into their, you know, quote unquote buddy buddy, and they really want to play for him because he's the guy they came to play for, maybe it works better. That it does with with, but I mean, if you're not a scorched earth guy, you're not a scorched earth guy. You can't you can't fake it because then they'll really know. You just got to be who you are, and I don't think he's that dude. And his his way has worked at other places. So, but it, it does not work overnight. It usually it got it it didn't get much better before it got before it got good. It it wasn't like these progressions that you saw. Like I think South Florida was two and ten their first year. Yeah. And then maybe you had a losing record the next year, and then all of a sudden they're going to a bowl. It's not something that like works right away, maybe like the scorched earth guys. But in the end, you know, the 2020 Florida State team might be better off with with this with this approach. Yeah. The 2018 team certainly wasn't. The interesting thing is like when you are the nice guy and then you try to be more firm. And by the and- way, I don't think he's like I think he's harder, he he's more he's harder than we let on or that we know about. Yeah. I don't think that. he's just like dapping these dudes all the time and saying, Hey man, good try. You'll get him next time. I think he can be a bit of a hard ass, a hard butt. Sorry. I got a message that we curse too much on the show. Um, but I, I do think that, that that's in there. We just don't see it a lot. Like Jimbo, you could hear it. You could see it on the sidelines after every play. He's not like that, but that doesn't mean he's not getting on them hard in the locker room after a game. Heck, he called him quitters. 
That's not a buddy. Yeah. Well, that's you know, the he's, thing. He's I, got some of that. He's got some of that in him. You can't be both. And I think he tried to find some sort of medium between both. And you can't do that. You have to pick one side or the other. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess, to the what I was mentioning earlier about uh, whatever we might have or not discussed at the uh, the company dinner. Again, yeah, I mean, he, he's been tough on these kids. But I think he's also trying to be really arm around them, like try to work. Let's work through this together. What's going on? What's on your mind? Let's let's figure this out, which is a cool, which is a good thing. But I just I think it's tough to, to, to jump between those two when your your default setting is more of personable, kind, gentle human being. Uh, you can be the jerk like a Jimbo. And then when you actually do show a heart, it's like, oh, man, that's cool. Coach actually cares. Uh, whereas coach is being nice and, and, and thoughtful and kind and like, damn, coach has called me a quitter. Coach is being a jerk today. Like, screw that. I don't want to hear that. I think it's, I think it's easier. Well, it works to- the other way too, though, man. Like, if you're a hard ass all the time, sorry, hard butt, and you're always riding them, well, you can tune that out pretty quickly too. You know, Jimbo yelling for the hundredth time in a day maybe doesn't have the same impact as Willie Taggart yelling for the first time. Right. You know that that there, there's that that works too. You just never gonna let me get anything in here about Jimbo being a positive influence. Well, on no, this I mean, FSU, I, man, I, hey, I lived 2013. I thank Jimbo for it. That was a great season to cover, and that was an awesome team to cover. Um, I had, you know, uh, I had a lot of good moments with Jimbo. But you know, just say that we'll see. We'll see. I just again that whatever we can say, whatever we need to say about 2018 to qualify that it whatever Willie did didn't work. But I just don't think that again that means that his approach won't work for 2020. And he's trying to build for 2020, 2019 and 2020. You know, that's that's how programs are built. It's not just one season at a time, and then I'm going to change this, I'm going to change that. I'm going to change completely who I am because that didn't work. You either believe in what you're doing or you don't. And we'll see. But, you know, obviously there's no reason to believe that this is going to work through one season. But maybe in 2020, when we're ready, getting ready to go to the Fiesta Bowl, we'll be singing the praises of old buddy, buddy Willie Taggart. FSU EC 29, what is y'all's opinion on why James Blackman was redshirted? Is DeAndre gone after this season? It seems that the fan base is excited to see a change at the quarterback position. Great show. Keep up the good work. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Yeah, this I, one, I, I don't know. I'll this never one. quite understand what yeah, they did with it. Never, him. never. And, and the worst thing is the theories that have been floated out, like there's some sort of agreement that, that Willie had with DeAndre, like I'm going to you – know, I'll give you this – I mean, any. If that happened, that's the worst thing that ever happened at this university in the football program for the last 40 years then. If if we're brokering deals with career 53% completion percentage quarterbacks coming off knee injuries that ditch their team on senior day. Like if that happened, if there was some sort of backdoor deal, like this is my plan, like I think – you know, I, I'm with you, DeAndre. I mean, if that happened, if any sort of agreement, I, I don't. I mean, that that would that would break my heart more than anything that's happened uh, since Taggart took over. Yeah, it would just be odd. Like I, I don't. Obviously, I don't think in August they played in a redshirt Blackman because then they wouldn't have played him for four plays against Wake and one play against Miami, and they just wouldn't have done it. Are the the meaningless snaps at the end of the Clemson game? Let a walk on do that. I, so that's what doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. I just I, I I legitimately don't know what why that was. They I mean it might be Occam's razor. It might just be as simple as they thought he was the better quarterback, and they didn't play Blackman because they didn't think he was as good as DeAndre, which doesn't say doesn't speak highly of Blackman. Yeah. But in the one game he played, he was pretty darn good, and he could certainly throw a deep ball, um, and he could move around a little bit. So the whole thing was just you know I I I. I've never quite understand it. Uh, Knowles 2200. Hey, guys, just subscribe today, but I've been listening to you guys on Wake Up War Chant all season. I am now in the acceptance stage of grief, and I'm ready for 2019. I enjoy the show and keep up the great work. Awesome. Right. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for the thanks yeah. for the membership. Yeah. yeah, welcome, man. Or uh, woman. No, or young lady. I don't know What's the mean. name? I just Knowles twenty two hundred. I said, you know, thank you. Man. Oh yeah, you're right. It could be a man. Man's or interchangeable. Or... We're all you know men under God's eyes or whatever, right? Well, either way, you're in a great club now. Yeah, no. you're part uh, of the you're part of the War Champ membership club. Yeah, it's he a very knew, uh, or she exclusive knew honor. The Get in there on the tribal council, mix it up a little. Don't take things personally. Yeah. Have a good time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, apparently, that looks like the only message they've wrote so far, which is a good thing. 
Don't write. Just just read and laugh. Uh, don't get involved yeah, with these lurk. things. A lot of lurkers on the yeah, on the site. Lurk. All right. Uh, JDDA Noel. Do they have a question? No, they just want to tell us they subscribed. Uh, then they're just letting us know they've moved on to the acceptance. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah. Uh, I'm not there. Uh, JDDA Noel, if Jimbo took the LSU job two years ago, who would be our coach? Taggart or someone else? Would our program be better off? I blame Jimbo more than Willie. So, uh, it would not be Taggart. Um, two years ago? Well, so what, I don't know. He, out of- he was 10-2 and two season coming off in South Florida. Yeah. Either way, the program would be in better shape. But I don't know that I don't know who the head coach will be, and I don't know who was available after like the fifteen season or the sixteen season. Well, what's the question? Do you think would our program be better off if Jimbo left two years ago and we had a new coach as opposed to? What oh, we either have way, now yeah. No, I, I, either way, I, I I don't I don't necessarily think they're mutually exclusive, but I would say that even if they'd hired somebody else, you'd be two years into their program. And I don't think the roster would have been. That's that's what two less years of that roster. And so I, I just think, yeah, I, I think it, you'd be two years into a new the the new system, the new coaching staff, and it wouldn't. I mean, it can't be worse than it was this past year. It could it could have been two and ten. Could have been uh, one but, and well, sure, but I mean, I think there's got to be a floor that Florida State is at, and I'm not talking about record wise, but I'm talking about you got outscored by ten points a game. Florida State did. You lost games by forty points and thirty points and fifty points. Um, that you, it's hard to imagine it being much worse than that, unless they hired. I I, I don't even know Chizik. You know, without a, without Cam Newton, I, I don't know who would have Daryl Mudra. Like I don't know who they could have hired that would have been that would have had this place were would have had this program in a worse place than it is right now with the combination of Jimbo's last year. Taggart's first year. Yeah. How about my guy Lane Kiffin? He went five and seven. Did bad he go five for, and seven this year? Yeah. Bad year for people Lane. People are mentioning him for like the Georgia Tech job. No, I didn't say that. No, hey, I mean it? I saw that on Twitter. Oh. Like, ooh, Lane would be good in Atlanta. That'd be awesome. It's like yeah. what? He can't win at FAU or FIU. Which which one is it? AU. FAU. Oh, the FAU. Sorry. The FAU. He's the Owls. Well, we won ten games last year in a conference title. Yeah. Hey, I want consistency, Lane. Yeah, I'm with you. That's all I want. Uh, Gretzky's dad. That's the name. Of the, that's, I need to look. Can you look that up, Corey, while I read this question? Like, what? what's Wayne Gretzky's dad's name? Because maybe that's what this guy's name is. But uh, Oh, all right. Well, let's see. He goes by Gretzky's dad. Jimbo lack the team in a shambles. I think he tried to admit left the team in shambles. I suspect part of Willie's problems were Jimbo's leftovers. Eight and 12 are the ones blamed. There must be others. The O line is all on Jimbo and the trick. The lack of discipline is mostly Willie, but we had a lot of penalties and timeouts with ten men on the field. Yes, it got worse. I guess we're just a we're just a sounding board now for people. We're just yeah, and we I think we all agree with that, yeah. right? For the most part, uh, I don't agree with anything that's critical about Jimbo. Uh, <laughs> I disagree. I know you do. I know you're playing your role, but I know you do. Uh, what's Gretzky's uh, dad's name? Walter. Walter. And he passed away. No, he's still alive. And uh, he's 80 years old. 80 years young. Good for that. All right. We'll pretend your name's Walter then, Gretzky's dad. All right. Noel Dad, 84. So his, his instruction to Wayne Gretzky, his famous adage to Wayne when he was growing up was, go to where the puck is going, not where it has been. Oh, deep. There you go. There you go. Deep. Good way to live life, really. Deep, deep, yeah. Noel Dad 84. So no more FSU football games for the year. I know it sucks. Any other games you guys are looking forward to this year? Yeah, I think SEC championship game will be good. I'll be up there covering that. Um, I would like to watch the uh, Big 12 championship game rematch of the Red River uh, shootout. I'm not calling it the Red River rivalry. It's the Red River shootout. It always will be. But it's going to be at noon. I'll be on the road up to Atlanta. I'd like to see that game. I'm sure there'll be a lot of bowl games that'll that'll interest me, that I'll have on the TV as I'm uh, contemplating life without football. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the game. I love college football. And, and the whole coaching carousel stuff to me, I think is I – I, mean, I don't think there's anything the NFL does better than college, but the one thing they definitely don't do better is off-season drama with coaches. Yeah, I mean, NFL is just like, all right, who had the top five defense or offense in the league? 
get me their coordinator hired. Right uh, here, it's like we're poaching people. We're, we're we're stealing this guy. We're bringing this guy back from the dead. It's it's awesome, man. I'm all about this Mac Brown thing, and uh, we'll see what uh, Georgia Tech gets. But yeah, there's I'm certain when these bowl games come out, they're saying maybe UCF and Florida in, in a bowl game. Although UCF won't have their quarterback, so I won't be excited for that. But obviously, that gives us something to root for. Uh, Florida's failure. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm excited about Alabama, Georgia, just to see if Georgia can hang hang with them and put up, make them make them be in a game in the fourth quarter because that hasn't happened all year. And then um, uh, Alabama, Clemson, whenever that happens, yeah. that's it. I this, I mean, you know, Syracuse might but go to a New Year's Six bowl. Like yep. three lost Syracuse. That that the that and I don't think that Syracuse is a pretty good team, but that just shows you what what kind of college football season this has been. And we went five and th- seven in a it. three loss Syracuse team. We like usually it would seven. take like one loss for Syracuse to get there. Yeah. They have three losses. I don't know that they beat anybody good, and they might get to a New Year's Six game because there's nobody else that's any good. They beat Florida State and they almost beat Clemson. That's pretty much what they've. Well, almost. Yeah, I'm saying I said beat yeah. anybody good. No, I'm so with you, but that's Florida that's State their anymore. resume. Yeah, I mean they. They lost to they lost to Notre Dame badly. Um, I mean, I guess they beat Boston College when Boston College was still ranked, or no? They beat Boston College the uh, last week when Florida and Florida State were playing. I'll, you know, honestly, I I almost would kind of want to I almost kind of want to see Oklahoma play Alabama just because Oklahoma maybe they'll get the ball last and they can score and, and win fifty six to fifty four. Uh, they're, surely their defense isn't going to stop anything, but I'd be I'd be excited to see that. I don't think Clemson has a shot against Alabama. I don't I don't care how good their defense is. A defensive line is I don't I, I don't I, Trevor Lawrence I think will get punked. Uh, you give uh, Saban a month to figure these things out. It ain't happening, man. But the fact that Oklahoma put so many points up on Georgia last year in the Rose Bowl makes me believe that Oklahoma could probably do something similar uh, if they were to play Alabama. I'd be excited, more excited to see that than Clemson. I'm I'm so over Alabama and Clemson. I was over that matchup uh, after the first quarter in the Sugar Bowl last year. Well, yeah, they do. They do seem to play every year. Uh, I just, I, you know, I, I can't imagine Oklahoma holding Alabama under sixty. And can you imagine the Nick Saban team giving up sixty points? I mean, I know that kid's a really good. He's a dynamic quarterback, but I, I just don't see it happening. Lincoln Riley, man, he's the next best thing. All right, uh, JMW eleven X basketball question mark. Maybe a quick preview of the rest of the season to come. I'm sure you will be busy with football topics. Thanks. You two are both awesome. Thank you, man. He's from Smyrna. No, duh. He's from Smyrna, Georgia. So oh, there we go. Smyrna. Good old Smyrna. Yeah. I believe that's where Julia Roberts is from. Ooh. All right. And Eric Roberts, her brother, that oh. they don't talk anymore. Best of the um, best. But, One of the most underrated uh, martial arts movies in history. He was what? In it. What is? Best of the best. Oh, I didn't hear you say that. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Uh, you got a quick preview for the rest of the season? It's going to be fun for basketball. Yeah, they got Duke coming to the Civic Center. That's going to yeah, be that'll be fun. fun. Um, you, you know, I, I'm just interested because we all think of them again as this top elite eight team, and they were. I mean, that's where they got to, but they they kind of were on the bubble to get into the tournament last year. So it's not like they they're used to winning a ton of games on the road. None of these guys have been very good on the road, and that's more than anything what I want to see. We know they can play pretty well at home. And they played really well at home in conference the last really three years, but to to make the tournament and to get a high seed in the tournament, you got to figure out a way to win games on the road. And the ACC is so hard, man. Pittsburgh's I mean, gotten better. They're all good. Louisville's like, gotten Louisville's better. Louisville's not even ranked, and they beat Michigan State, who yeah. was ninth. You know, they're they're just these are hard teams to play and hard teams to beat. So, um, I, I I'm I'll just be interested in like who takes that next step. Like we know Forrest and Man, we know what they are. Uh, Cabin Gully certainly seems to be a guy that can be something pretty special. But who's another other guy? Walker, and then also Walker, I don't know, Vassal, and then also when are oh, they getting I, Cooper back? Those are the big questions. Yeah. I mean, would you agree that every team in the ACC is better than they were last year? Um, I mean, you could say that, I, I guess. Um, it certainly looks like it. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I I can't think of anybody that isn't off the top of my head. Pitt was such a abysmal mess last year. I think they're six and one. Or I mean, I don't. Did they win their ACC Big Twelve matchup from the other night? But they were six and zero. They lost in the uh, in the final seconds. They lost on the road by like one point. Yeah, there was that first loss. Um, 
you know, Louisville, obviously, I think with uh, Chris Mack there now, they're, they're, they're no longer have an interim coach. They're going to be playing better than they were I think last Miami year. Miami might, might not be as good as they were last year. Oh, yeah. Um, What's going on yeah, over I mean, there? You know, Duke is Duke. North Carolina is North Carolina. Um, Louisville, Syracuse, Florida State. They're Speak all Speak up. Good, Corey, man. wake up. Corey, wake up. All right, waking up. What happened to your microphone? You sound very low now. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, I'm no. sorry. Were you in the bathroom or something? It sounds like you're in the bathroom. How about now? Better. Better. Okay, sorry. No, I think my thumb accidentally hit the volume All right. Volume button. Stay locked in. Here we go. Next sorry, question. man. Sorry. Doke FSU won. What's up, guys? Do you consider the university's next most important hire the athletic director position? Not only will they have the worry of the fundraising for the next facility update, but also they must hire a baseball coach who, by the way, will be replacing a legend and then evaluate the current football program. Uh, probably that's that's yeah. Valid. I mean, it's a, it's an important hire, and then you know Leonard Hamilton, though he looks like he did when he was forty five, he's not forty five, and uh, he can't coach forever either. So it's it's going to be a really big hire. I do think with baseball, though, you know, I don't know if Coburn's going to be out of there by the time they're hiring a baseball coach, right? You know, I, I don't because again, you know, John Thrasher, he's you know he's not going to be the president forever either. So if he's going to be retired in a few years. Is an AD going to come want to work for like a lame duck president? Yeah, you know. So I I, I don't know what kind of all, what kind of options they're going to have until there's a new president even, and when will that be? Uh, but I certainly don't think I don't think they're going to. I I would be surprised if they hired an AD before like the summer, and you'd have to think they would know who the baseball coach is going to be before the summer. Yeah, because then you, otherwise you'd be going to a summer recruiting period with no idea who's going to be running your baseball program. So, yeah, I mean, I would yeah, say the, the president would, position you know, is the most, so, the next most important hire I, because I feel like probably Coburn and Thrasher are going to go out together. So obviously, you know, the president is going to take precedence over the the AD yeah. hire. And listen, for whatever criticism people had of John Thrasher not being an intellectual, not being part of academia, I think most of us agree that he's done a really bang up job on the university side, getting the school, uh, you know, the whole uh, AAU recognition. Is that what they call it? American Athletics University or something like that? Um, oh, there's some big sort of know. there's some sort of big stamp that you want on your university, um, uh, and, and he's trying to get Florida State in there and trying to get Florida State into the top 25. Uh, so, and, and not in the um, athletic sense. I'm trying to AAU. I know AAU's like you know uh, whatever you call it, it's, uh, amateur sports. What's the right. freaking university thing here? I got to find this now. Uh, bum. Yeah, Association of American Universities, AAU. I apologize. AAU. All right. Okay. Well, I All can right. say AAU, right? I'm yeah, overthinking yeah. it. Anyhow, it's the president's the next most important hire. And despite, again, what everybody thought about John Thrasher's background as simply being a, a politician, man, he he kept Jimbo here for a few years. That I know that might make some people angry, but I'm, I'm happy that Jimbo stayed as long as he did. Uh, he kept Jimbo happy for as long as he could, kept the football team going really well. And I think... There's probably no other university president in the entire nation that cares as much about their athletic success as John Thrasher. It's probably a pretty bold statement. There's a lot of university presidents out there, but he's not going to go to bed until he knows his football program's back up and running to to where it should be. Uh, that makes me feel really good. So I, I think definitely whoever's going to replace him, uh, it's going to be some really big shoes to follow, at least for the uh, the for the athletic uh, chest thumping fan. Yeah, no, he's he. Uh, you're right that he does care. That he also, you know, when you look at basketball, he didn't he didn't fire Leonard Hamilton. Yeah, he stayed the course there, and that worked out pretty well. Yeah. All right, um, we'll try to go a little bit more tempo on this. We had so many questions, Corey, but they're all pretty good so far. Uh, Norfolk Knoll, gentlemen, love the show. I listen every day from Stuttgart, Germany. Awesome, hell yeah, man! Appreciate prove that. it. Uh, keep finding the good fight or whatever you're doing out there in Stuttgart, Norfolk, no. All right, it goes without saying that Coach Taggart and staff did not do a great job of coaching. I get it. With that said, however, do you guys think that he was in a no-win situation in regards to trying to continue the streaks and simultaneously correct the team culture? If he really wanted to lay down the law and sit players, good players, during the season, then he definitely loses games and the bull streak goes bye-bye but he had the pressure of the winning season bull streak to deal with, so he had to play the best guys regardless of how undisciplined they were. In other words, wouldn't it have just been easier to clean house if he didn't have the pressure of the streaks? Thanks, and keep up the, uh, the good work. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a strong take. Yeah, I agree really with that sentiment. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, you remember when Tom Herman went or Charlie Strong went in Texas? Not that like it worked, but he kicked off like twelve guys. Right. You know, he didn't have to worry about a a, a four decade long streak that Taggart did. One that was so tenuous, so it was on the cusp of being uh of being snapped last year. And yeah, I, I think that does play a role in it. That you're trying like mad. Once you see what you have, you're trying like mad to just get to six wins. Um, and it, you know, obviously it didn't work out anyway. So in hindsight, you should have just sat them and, you know, two and ten, okay. Um, you know, five and seven, two and ten. I mean, either way, they're not nearly acceptable for Florida State. But yeah, I think I don't think it played a huge role. But but I do think because I think in your maybe even is is equally important as the streaks is it's your first year, you don't want to come into your first year whether Florida State had lost lost the streak in '09, you don't want to come in your first year and lay an egg and go three and nine not at a place like Florida State. So there's pressure on you to at least win some games your first year even though you know you're not going undefeated. Um, so I think that was part of it too. It's just your first year. It's hard to just sacrifice chances for wins. All right. I know you had another thought on that. Um, yeah. No, I, sorry. Yeah. I mean, the, I think that's what came up at the, the dinner the other night that I mentioned earlier in the show was that I think I was listening to, to Jeff Cameron and uh, you know, Jeff Cameron mentioned that there was probably some things that Willie sacrificed from a fundamental philosophical belief um, you know, maybe bent some rules or maybe cut some corners and did some things, and it ultimately didn't pay off. My question, I think, was to Ira at the dinner was like, well, what, what, what did Willie do? That like, what did Willie do that went against his his core constitution of things? That you know, I mean, obviously nothing helped. I mean, again, I can't really imagine this thing being that much worse by him sitting guys or playing certain players. I do wonder what what Jeff thought was some of the things that that Willie did that might have gone against his philosophy to just to try to get this thing uh, running at a, a fairly competent level. Because again, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, but uh, he didn't go score short. I he think clean house. I think if didn't. you look at the quarterback, I think he he made it very clear in December of last year that DeAndre Francois was not a leader. And that he didn't like the way he interacted with his teammates. He didn't write. He didn't like the way he handled the position of being a quarterback. But he thought, I think normally he'd have just scrapped it and said, "Man, I can't. I'm not even going to try with this kid." You're kidding me. You you Snapchatted when your team was in a game. I'm not. You might. You're not even on my team. But he thought, rightly or wrongly, turns out probably wrongly, that Francois gave him the best chance to win. So he did everything he could to get Francois back in the good graces of the team and uh, you know, try to make him more of a leader. He certainly talked him up to the media about moving back on campus and, and all that stuff. And, you know, and he, even when he talked about the running backs running better, he gave Francois credit for it. I think he did everything he could to try to build that kid up when in hindsight, knowing that you're not going to go to a bowl anyway, you play the kid that's the true sophomore and, uh, and maybe even cut bait with Francois. I just but he thought the more experienced guy, the more talented guy, maybe in his eyes, certainly maybe he thought it was a better thrower, um, was the better option, even though he had all these intangibles that he didn't like. He was a he was a good enough quarterback that he needed he needed him to run the offense. Yeah, yeah, I, don't, I mean, it obviously yeah, wasn't just, true, but yeah. to me, that's really kind of got to be the only explanation. Because he didn't owe Francois anything when his guy didn't recruit him. No. Not a guy you'd want on your team. I mean, I, I can't imagine if he found out that the backup cornerback was Snapchatting during a game and having, you know, whatever it was, two off-the-field issues. I'm not assessing blame on those off-the-field issues, but Francois's name was in the news twice. Um, that, that he would put up with something like that. But I think that maybe the first year, new offense, experienced guy, can run a little bit, although he couldn't, it turned out, he's our best option. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, let's just move on. Northern Knoll 84, wake up! Love the show, guys. Sitting here in Maine, watching 10 inches of snow pile up in my driveway. Ugh. Man. Thoughts and prayers. Thoughts. And prayers. Yeah. Uh, my question is, did Willie make a mistake not going scorched earth? For context, a guy like Frost went, I mean, um, I should have probably read this before I read it out loud, but we'll finish it off. Uh, for context, a guy like Scott Frost went to Nebraska, ran dudes off, told the fans it's going to get worse before it gets better, and took it down to bedrock. 
Willie from the outside anyway seemed like he tried to change culture but win some games and keep players that we might call malcontents on the roster. Is that going to come back to bite him in the long game? Yeah, I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see on that. But uh, as we just talked for the last few minutes about that, yeah, there's, a, again, I, I, you can't walk fine lines in leadership positions, I don't think, uh, by and large. You, you have to have conviction. You have to believe in things. And I, I know Willie does believe in his, his system. He's he said it many times that this is going to get better. Be patient that uh, he's going to fix this thing. There, Florida State's going to return to greatness. Uh, but it feels like there was a lot of forks in the road uh, that he encountered this year. And most of them, it seems like, at least now, he went 5-7. and seven. He took a lot of wrong turns. Uh, doesn't mean that he can't learn from this. Uh, I don't know how much of this will will. But just the, into- the example that he used maybe isn't the best example because that guy went four and eight. And we won't know how good a Scott a higher Scott Frost is until about the same time we know about Willie Taggart, which is twenty twenty. They both had losing seasons. Well, I think his thing is that Scott Frost never, you know, Scott Frost didn't pen a letter to the Players Tribune saying that he's here to win championships. That's the goal. Um, and, and then at no point, you know, he said many times, I'm surprised too, everybody. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. Uh, or he said, he, he said things to that extent. You know, Scott Frost came out week four or five and was just like, yeah, it's not good. It's not going to get any better, but I'm going to fix it. You know, again, at no point did Willie brace us for five and seven, for 41 straight winning seasons being ruined, for 36 straight bowl trips being snapped. At no point. What, did, did he seem like that was going to be a legitimate thing on his radar? Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, that that means he's doomed. Like, these are just, when you add up the things that happened this season, there's not a lot to feel good about. doesn't mean that things can't change. Things change. I mean, there's going to be new coaches, we think. There's going to be new leaders. Uh, there's going to be some new players stepping up. Uh, so things can change. But, again, it, it, there are so many steps in this in this season that just felt like missteps, and and I don't five. I just don't think five and seven is part of anybody's process. It's it was part of Scott Frost's process, or at least that's the way he, he marketed it when it started going bad. Yeah, this is you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. I just don't think five and seven was any part um, of Willie's process. Like, oh, I'm not coming to Florida State. Uh, we're going to win championships, but it's going to be really, really crappy this first year. Like all this stuff, all these great streaks, probably not going to happen because we're going to have to shake things up a lot. It doesn't seem like that was part of his process, but here we are. Yeah, it would have been weird if he just said that, though. He could have warned people better that, okay, we're, we do have some issues. But, man, imagine what you we any of us would have no, said if I, Willie Taggart was I, like, look, I'm guys, not saying that. the bowl streak might be in jeopardy. Out. I'm not saying he's going to come out, but, guys, prepare for all this good stuff that you you appreciate and value for all to be gone. But, sure, I mean, there was no point where, like, this is going to take time, and I know people here – Want to get back to the top, and there's no one who wants to get this thing back to the top faster than I do. But we got to be patient. It's going to be painful at times, and so we're going to get this thing fixed. There's yeah. things you can no, say. No, he definitely should have done that and could have done that. He didn't do that at all. He he talked about this team as if he thought it was going to win 10 or 11 games. Yeah. Again, I asked him in, in spring. This was a team that 2017 was preseason ranked number three in the nation. They finished the season seven and six. What are they? What are they closer to? And he's like, what do you think? He's like, I see a lot of – I mean, I, I, he he hedged his answer to, to the – he thought this was closer to a team that was one of the best in the nation than it was just some afterthought that w- went to a lousy bowl game. No offense to Shreveport. Again, I appreciate his optimism. It didn't work out. Um, does Again, doesn't mean that he's a bad coach or this thing won't get fixed. It is, though, hard to feel optimistic that it's going to happen. Um, but here we are. We're gonna work well, more to the point, when he displays any optimism in April or in August, none of us are going to believe him. It's a, it's a prove, it's show and prove now. Um, you know, he can tell us all he wants that he's optimistic and he's got a lot of good players and there are no turds on the team. But man, it doesn't matter. What, it's just all lip service now. You got to go out and prove it. Uh, hi, Corey and Aslan. It's Kadar from New York City. Love the show. I've been reading between the lines of some of the quotes from the top flight recruits Willie has either committed or is close to bringing in. It appears part of the pitch to the recruits is, and I'm paraphrasing, my current upperclassmen are a lost cause. The culture here was terrible. Can't do anything with them. Believe in what I do and what I have done in the past with turnarounds. 
I have to think some of that rhetoric gets back to some of our players currently on the roster. Could that impact the way they have bought in and performed this year? Also, in regards to nitpicking at the way we practice, is there any way we can get a USF beat writer or someone who covers a team on the show and talk about how practice was at South Florida as that turnaround was constructed? Love the show for offseason sulking. Go Knowles. That wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah. Find whoever the South Florida beat writer was for Tampa in 15 and 16 yeah. and see what, when, it, when it turned around because I'm sure they had a ton of access to South Florida. Oh, yeah. Because um, they're just looking for any uh, publicity they can get. Uh, yeah, I, you know, that's the thing about when you, when the, the fine line you have to walk, when you're talking, when you're talking to your, your fans before a season and, you know, part of you, may, maybe Willie was more realistic than we know, but he doesn't want to tell his team that like, guys, it's going to be a long, it's gonna be a long time. It's gonna be patient. We got some work to do. We got some serious holes that we got to fill because then you're calling kids that you're coaching serious holes and you don't want to do that. You want to, you know, he was trying to build them up. It did not work. But, you know, I, I don't know that. I mean, that's that just goes on in recruiting, right? Like, you know, half of recruiting is just telling the recruit what he wants to hear. Like, yeah, you can come in and play right away. Sure. <laughs> sure you can. Um, and because they're all going to believe it because they all think they're great. So they're going to come in and think, yeah, I can beat out Jalen Ramsey for a corner spot. Or Sean McGuire was like, yeah, I'm not scared of Jameis Winston. All right. Sure. Come on. You know, I, I think that's part of the recruiting process is, you know, that, and they did that all the time, man. Like you, when USC was going great and when Miami was going great, they recruited over really good players. Like guys that were juniors got passed up by guys that were freshmen because they were incredible, like Ray Lewis and people like that. Or USC, you know, name someone. They all, they, if they were a badass as a sophomore, uh, freshman or sophomore, they would play over the upperclassmen. And, yeah, I, I think that's part of the selling process. And if it bothers the seniors on the team, well, all right, get better. That's one thing that, that Willie has been really transparent about, though. He said it, you know, my job is to find players that are going to take your job. So yeah. I, I don't think there's going to be any sort of collateral damage for what Willie's selling on the recruiting trail. It's going to get back to players and they're going to give up on him or, or not give full effort. And I'll, you you want to do stuff to breed competition too, quite honestly. And if that helps breed competition, have at it, man. If it makes the senior defensive tackle try harder because there's somebody that's going to try to take his job, good. It should be that way. And if he backs down and doesn't play hard because he's upset that a freshman might take his job, well, he's not a guy you want playing for you anyway. Maxwell Gibbs, nook if you buck, gents. Not going to sugarcoat this one, but Willie sucked as a coach during his first season. I didn't see one bit of improvement from game one to game 12. There's nothing to be excited about going into 2019 except for touchdown Terry. What does Willie need to do to instill more discipline in this program? It's pretty embarrassing to have Chauncey Gardner Johnson call you out. Yeah, man. Well, that's what we're going to try to figure out in the next, I don't know, seven, eight months, Maxwell. Again, I think it starts. He's got to replace. He's got to replace at least three coaches. And I know that sounds weird. Like, give me names, Aslan. I don't know. I mean, obviously, I think we need a new special teams coach. I don't have that big of a problem with David Kelly, but if, if you know, he's better suited to be behind the scenes, do that. Uh, but you can't just be like, that's it, those two guys, and we're going to hold stand pat. There needs to be – the defense needs help. Everything needs help. So you get a new special teams coach. You need to figure out a different way to maybe divvy up responsibilities on the offense. Like Corey said, I think maybe – you just you trust Walt Bell to, to work everything while you be the delegator and the overseer of everything and then give, you know, Harlan some sort of help with the defensive backs. And not that he said he wanted help, but tell him that he needs help and this is what it's going to be like. And um, I don't know, you know, get a good quarterback. I mean, maybe there's a great I mean, I don't want to get the whole grad transfer speculation market, but maybe there's a really good scrambling quarterback out there that is going to be able to mask a lot of deficiencies that your offensive line is not going to be able to pick up or improve on in, in 12 months of time. Uh, and who knows? Maybe James Blackman will, will beat out DeAndre France while he's still here, and then that'll spark a lot of changes. Again, man, they're, they're Cam Akers, you should still feel good about Cam Akers. If Kalen LeBourne is still rehabbing well, then maybe by October, again, he might come back on the DeAndre Francois return in, in, in one year. I still think he's going to probably need more than that since he's a running back. But there's a lot of players to feel good about. For as, as bad as the recruiting was, you have Marvin Jones to build with. Uh, you have Stanford Samuels, who I know looked really rough in the Florida game, but I think he's got to be a good player for you. I mean, he he has 
the measurables. It seems like he's got the, uh, the the desire. He just needs to be reined in a little bit more. There's good players on this team still. It's not a 5-7 and seven roster. Um, but, yeah, you need to change the coaches, and there's guys to believe in. Uh, but I think the quarterback position, if, if that can get an instant improvement, uh, everything gets lifted up. Agreed. Well said. FSU guy, 1989. <laughs> God, Corey. Oh, you're so kind. It's like I could just see myself. Like, I see Brady coming to you after he goes like Golden Sombrero over four. Like, Dad, did I take some good hacks? Yep, you did <laughs> some really good hacks, son. Good job. Uh, FSU guy, 1989. Well, now what? I'll tell you. Next season, we're going to have some JUCO guys and true freshmen as the best O-line in the country. Then you'll have a backfield with Cam and Lambo. Then Howell dropping dimes a scary Terry Hall of Famer and all Deshaun's. Then our defense will cause so much havoc, predicting number one havoc rating, that nobody will score on us. DJ Matthews will return every punt for a touchdown, and we will actually read the rules that say we don't have to start every possession from within our own 10-yard line. All that being said, I really do think that Willie can turn it around and make this place nationally relevant again, but honestly, what can truly be done between now and the start of next season that can make you truly feel that FSU is a good team and not just a better team? I kind of answered that previously. Corey, how about you? What uh, can truly be done? Yeah. yeah. Are you still pondering? <laughs> Is that okay? Um, I More than anything, it's uh, to me, it's the, uh, the Florida State's always going to be penalized a lot. You can't look like you're disorganized. Not look like you're disorganized. You can't be disorganized. And you have to be able to take away what teams do well. Try to anyway. Let's just, let's see some adjustments made in game uh, that that win you football games. That's kind of what I want to see. I, I again, I think this roster will be good enough in a year or two where he's winning eight or nine games. But at Florida State, eight or nine games isn't enough. It seems great right now, but uh, it certainly beats five wins. But it's not enough. You need to compete for championships. And if you're this sloppy and this undisciplined and make this many foolish pre-snap dumb mistakes, you're not going to beat good teams. And so that's what I want to see cleaned up heading into 2020 is no matter the win-loss record, say it's anywhere from six wins to nine wins, I want to see how they play and if they play smarter and if they, they, they look like they're coached better. Um, all right, there's so many more questions, and we've already gone over an hour. I'm going to try to figure out some way to get this done quicker. Uh, Renegade underscore state basically had a two-part thing. Um, seems a little bit Well, that's a good start is to go with a two-part question. <laughs> he seems a little bit skeptical that uh, Alonzo Hampton will be f- gone because uh, Taggart's hired him on four different occasions. This is different, though. Uh, it's Florida State. It's five and seven. Uh, his unit was And again, terrible. he can be reassigned. Yeah. You know, he doesn't have to be the special teams coach. He and then he also says to another area of the football program. Uh, to, to your point, Corey, about Taggart not changing his approach, staying the course of what he believes in. Uh, isn't that the type of stubbornness that we swore against with uh, Jimbo? Uh, to answer for you, I, I think it's it's obviously different when Jimbo was here for 10, 11 years and he refuses to change. Whereas Willie's here year one. You don't want to see him make radical you know, all right, we're going to go wishbone uh, offense now. You don't, yeah, I mean, you want him to, to have things that he believes in that are going to work and stick with him, uh, tweak some things, but it's obviously, it's different, any sort of perceived stubbornness with Willie as opposed to what Jimbo had, right? There you go. Said said well. Uh, Jason underscore Allie Good. Uh, Jimbo's personal life, uh, a foreshadowing of the team to come, if you ask me. I remember the moment I heard the news about his personal life issues with his wife. My instant thought was, there goes our team. That combined with his son's condition, and you only have so much to give at that point. Can't change that, but last year's debacle was far more than lack of facilities. He needed a change of scenery to get a new start, and we were the unfortunate recipients. All right, that's one. I don't disagree. I think a change of scenery was good for him. Quite honestly, I think he'd be, he just he, he was not happy here um, for a variety of reasons. He did have other things on his mind that weren't just football. Which I mean, life happens, um, and when you're a public figure, it can be pretty gross and nasty and 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 uh, public, quite frankly. And you know, Tallahassee is a small town, and rumors travel, and it it can be not a great place to. Um, I don't want to say it's not a great place to live, but small towns in general can be rough when you when you have that kind of 
off the field personal issues going on. And yeah, I think it was, you know, I, I really am interested to see what this reset does for him. Like if it really, because he, he just wasn't into it last year, man. He just was not was 16 too. just wasn't the same guy. I mean, it wasn't the same guy that I'd been talking to in 12 and 13. He was so much more defensive. Um, even after losses and uh, it just something, it just wasn't the same guy. And I hope the reset, because uh, he didn't seem like like his job. And I know he's, a, I know he is who he is and he's wired a certain way, but he also seemed to have fun a lot of time. Well, not a lot of the time, but you, he'd smile occasionally. And he, I think down deep, he really loved what he did. I don't, I never got that impression the last two years. So I hope at A&M he, he was able to reset and recalibrate and is now at least, enjoying his job again because i'm telling you being around him and talking to all the people that were around him he was not a joy of being around a joy to be around those last few years and he certainly didn't seem to enjoy what he did and enjoy where he was so maybe this place is just better for him as dylan 89 wake up shane from west virginia here fellas do you believe that blackman transferring is more likely than francois no Maybe Blackman wanted to preserve a year so he could have two years left somewhere else. That would leave Francois and Howell. Francois would likely start the year and then eventually be unseated by Howell later in the season where he cements his status as the signal caller for the next three plus years. Yeah, and I just no. don't I don't yeah. think James Blackman Yeah, no. I, I don't I, I mean I see the rationale there, but no, I don't I don't think I, I would I would be surprised by that. Uh, CPA No eleven, Aslan, since this is the post mortem Renegade Express, can you play postmortem by Slayer, or could you play November Rain by Guns N' Roses at this point? You've talked about it before. You guys rock. Keep up the great work. Uh, yeah, a little, your a little wish. GNR? Maybe a little GNR? Your wishes are uh, my demand. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Great rock, Corey Clark. <laughs> if I had my throat, I'd scream, wake up. All right, there we go. Uh, there's some postmortem for you from Slayer. I was always a... Uh, uh, Blood Rain or something like I don't know. Actually, I don't know any other Slayer songs. Uh, Rain and Blood. That's what I was thinking about. I, I was always that guy. Well, uh, all right, good. Let me get back to the thread. I think we're almost done, Corey. Um, no, we're not. Uh, four more questions. Oh, uh, Noel Tender. Word. Ooh, that's a very clever name. Do you think he went with Noel Tender as in like goaltender or like a bartender? I think goaltender. Goaltender. Hey guys. Uh, you know, football teams seem to keep injury information private, but was George Campbell actually healthy? Saw he made an appearance, but it was obviously limited. Same with Keith Gavin. Did he simply fall in the coach's doghouse? Could never have figured that George Campbell's four years and Keith Gavin's three years would combine to one career touchdown. Amen. Yeah, pretty remarkable. Amen. And that's Jim. I don't fault. think he was hurt. I mean, I think George Campbell did play some. Yeah. Um, what what a bizarre moment that was when he when he got all those reps against Notre Dame, yeah. um, and then yeah, I think Gavin just fell out of favor, and they were done playing him for the most part. Yeah, and that's something that we haven't talked about. Um, and I, actually, I'll talk about it at a different point in time because uh, we're we're running way too late. Garnet and Gomez, wake up, Corey and Aslan. Thanks for being one of the shining spots of this otherwise dreary season. Just want to know, if you are the head coach of this football team, how do you handle this offseason at the quarterback position? Do you try to get Francois to come back to ensure you have three guys at the position, or do you cut him loose and move on to Blackman and Howell in 2019? I tend to think he is trying to keep all three, but wanted to see what you guys thought. Side note, frustrating to hear Francois was playing corner before the game, but we have a hard time getting him to move around the pocket. I have to think cutting and jumping, playing around at corner is more demanding on the knees than moving around in and out of the pocket. Thanks again, guys. Go Knowles! Yeah, I don't know, because, yeah, I don't think you just want two quarterbacks going into the next season, but I also don't know what they think about that walk-on kid, McDonald. Um, and, again, I've watched him throw. He throws a, He can throw. Um, I don't know what his college situation, his offers were like, but, you know, we, we had a Heisman winner last year that was a former walk-on, so I'm not just shooing him away as, oh, as not a capable – backup quarterback at, at Florida State. I just I I would really worry about the dynamics of another Francois Blackman quarterback battle. I just I would. I, I on the team, on those two guys, um, on Sam Howell coming into the mix. 
Uh, I just I, I think they would be better off with with just two guys, but that's me talking, and I'm not inside Willie's head. And again, for all we know, Willie thinks that twelve is their best quarterback by far. Well, that's the thing. If he thought that twelve was his best quarterback this year, why is he going to be? Why is James Blackman going to be better than him in nineteen? This whole exactly. thing makes no sense, and it's a really good point by Garnet and Gomez. The question, because yeah, if if this whole thing was some sort of agreement that you're going to let Francois ride out 18 and then he's going to leave in 19 then you're still down to two quarterbacks and then walk on Nolan McDonald which you know I know you said you've seen him throw the ball and you think he's quite able I, I still don't know how viable of a candidate he is to, to be your starting quarterback well but the reality is if you're on your third string quarterback unless you're Ohio State and 14 you're you're having a bad season yeah. so you know I I, I don't know I I don't know what the situation will be. It's really, really uh, unique to have a quarterback that started now for two years that is not really beloved um, and not all that good, apparently, at least judging by his numbers. And more, more importantly, more to the point, not good fit for this offense. And, you know, does he come back for a fifth senior for a, for a senior year or does he move on to an offense that he thinks can get him more ready for the NFL um, with a better offensive line, you know, that's a lot. There's a lot of things at stake here. Um, a, a lot of, it's a lot of balls in the air and I don't know where they're going to land. I do think that Sam Howell will be here and I think James Blackman will be here. I don't know about the other one. R. Walling, CC. I think he means you, Corey Clark. Okay. I heard you quote the pro football focus offensive lineman grades for Georgia and Alabama. Let's be more realistic. What are the grades for Rutgers and Kansas? How does Florida State compare? They're worse. I, I'm going to go ahead and say that without knowing anything about the Kansas and Rutgers offensive lines. I'm going to say collectively Florida State's was worse. Yeah. What's crazy, though, is I saw your 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 numbers on that. Like Alabama had a bunch of guys in the hundreds, like 200. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's, you know, that's top. If there's 830 and you're in the top 100, what is that? Top 15 percent, 12 percent? You're the math major, brother. I'm not. Yeah, something like I mean, they had all five of their guys were in the top 12% of the country. All of Florida State's guys were in the bottom 20%. Yeah. George, all of Georgia's were in the top 5%. So, you know, again, I was so I was kind of surprised by Alabama's. Like, I thought they'd be higher, but even Alabama, Alabama's worst was 200 spots better than Florida State's best. Yeah. All right. Uh, That's preposterous. Ath Triplo. Um, is this it? Is this the last one? It is, but we have a couple phone calls. Maybe we'll do the phone calls next week. I don't think they're – one of them is uh, – I screened them. One of them we should play this week. Uh, it won't be as entertaining as as it could possibly be next week. Um, I try to get us out here quickly, Corey, and you start giving like three-minute really um, – I know, man. I know. I keep about doing Rutgers it. And Kansas offensive lineman play. Uh, last question from the mailbag. What's up, fellas? With the early signing period coming up, what is our target number of commitments in this class? What position group should we least, or we should we be least focused on recruiting? That's what he says. Uh, great show. Hope our 15th ranked basketball team gets a win on Wednesday night. Yeah, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, I think 20. You can sign up to 25. I think uh, Michael Langston has talked about 20 to 22. I think he said earlier in the year. I haven't seen the the most recent. Right. Number for them, um, I mean, offensive line, offensive line and linebackers, right? Can't have. I thought he said the least worry. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, then, um, wide receiver. receiver. Yeah, right. Receiver. No, yeah, I think so. Yeah, you got uh, all those guys. Tight end, something like that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, okay, let's go to the phone line and let's just let's go out on a high note, kind of uh, before because uh, Corey's got a sore throat, so we won't let Corey. Uh, give us deep introspective thoughts on life. Um, we'll play this one here. It, it, it made me chuckle a little bit, and uh, we'll go from there. Hey, this is Sevy from Nashville, originally from Plant City, Florida, the winter strawberry capital of the world, hometown of Major League Baseball legend, the lefty, Kenny Rogers. Just wanted to say real quick, you know, Florida ain't even thinking about planting that flag at midfield if Jimbo's nephew were still patrolling our sideline. <laughs> you ain't lying. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. There have been blows, son. They'd still be fighting at midfield. Uh, you ain't lying, Sevy. All right, man. Uh, we got a couple more phone calls. We'll, we'll get to them next week. We're going to take Friday off. We'll let Corey get healthy, and I'll just be lazy. Um, 
Oh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we're going to step aside. We're going to come back, and we're going to do the basketball game wrap right after this. Wake up, War Chant. You're listening to Wake Up, War Chant, all Knowles, every day. Now back to Corey and Aslan. Nothing lasts forever, even though November rain. All right, welcome back. Let's uh, let's get back to this basketball thing here. Corey, again, Florida State wins 73-72 to 72 over Purdue. Purdue is, what, 19th in the nation? Mm-hmm. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Boilermakers. Um, it's a 60-minute game. Florida State, I mean, of the 60 minutes, how many of them did they get outplayed to steal this from Purdue? I felt like, I mean, they, they – they, 40 minutes. Sorry, 60 minutes. I'm still in football yeah, I mode. Know I know. Yeah. I, that's why I saved you. Um, thank you. No, I, and Florida State played really well in the first half. Um, they did. So, they, you know, they were kind of a little unlucky just to be only up 12. But what you didn't like, and this won't be all negative Florida State, obviously, they won the game and beat a good team. Yeah, come on, man. Um the first eight to ten minutes of that second half, I thought they kind of uh, imploded a little bit. They were given, they were given up because they kept giving up threes on one end. Some of them were crazy shots. The kid was like Larry Bird. Yeah. Uh, I say that obviously because he's a white guy. Obviously. Um, and then on the other end, they a lot of charges, a lot of bad shots, a lot of a lot of long shots. They just didn't play well, really at all in the in the second half offensively. But it didn't matter. They made plays when they absolutely had to. MJ Walker made some shots after not scoring the first half. He scored 13. And, you know, they looked – what was interesting about it to me was for the first 10 or 12 minutes of that half, really the first 14 minutes of the half, they looked like the inexperienced team. Like they, 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 they were kind of frantic and, and frazzled a little bit. And then this final five or six minutes, I just thought defensively they didn't give them any good looks. They created a lot of turnovers, still struggled on offense a little bit. But we're really good defensively, so and that's why they won the game. Raquan Gray, um, I don't know for some reason I don't know he kind of stood out to me. It was cra- crazy to see him play clutch minutes. I guess mm-hmm. you could say. I mean, it was like Anthony Polite in Orlando at the Advocare Invitational, but um, as you know, uh, Leonard Hamilton said in his post game, he's still trying to find out his rotation, the guys that he wants to put out there, and he just he had a bunch of foul trouble. He had to kind of yeah. leave him out well, there. Well, that's the issue when you don't have Kofer, um, and that's a big deal. I know. People like this team the way it's structured. They play hard. Um, I don't think it comes down to the final few minutes if Phil Kofer's on this team right now. I, I think they'd have beaten Purdue, uh, obviously, by more than one point. It's just Raekwon Gray, I think, has a chance to be a really nice player. He's not Phil Kofer yet. He doesn't. He's not as good defensively. He's not as good offensively. Uh, he's not as good a rebounder. And what happens if Cat Miguel gets in foul trouble, you're in, you're in trouble because Kumaji – especially against a team like that, can really struggle to do anything for you defensively because um, they, they spread you out and he's just kind of uh, obsolete out there. But, you know, he did it a couple free throws during that run. I think it might have even been a one and one He hit both free yeah, throws to cut, the lead, to cut the lead to six to start uh, that run, the run that lasted, the 9-0 run that lasted four minutes. <laughs> but um, moving forward, you know, them winning these games without Phil Kofer says a lot about, what what Leonard's built here because he's playing ten or eleven guys and um, you know they won a game where PJ Savoy was two of eleven from three. Yeah, um, he's oh, got to stop this whole falling down on his three pointers thing. Well, he gets the call sometimes, so he, <laughs> he's been he's been uh, you know he got a four point play in the first half, yeah. so um, you know he's been awarded for it too much. Uh, but he's not going to shoot two of eleven every game, and a lot of those were just open looks that he just missed. Um, you got to he's got to knock those down. That's what he's on the team for, but. I thought they I thought they did a really good job with the Edwards kid. They made him work. And then he kind of bricked a couple free throws late. Yeah. He's a ninety two percent free throw. Airballed one from the floor. He airballed a couple threes. Yeah. He was really he was really frustrated. And Florida State can do that to you. If the kid for if the kid doesn't go off, I mean the kid for them hit four straight threes to start the half. They were seven of eight from three overall to start the first half. They went from down sixteen at one point late in the first half to up eight. Yeah. Um and usually when that happens, that's a wrap. The momentum's gone. The energy sucked out of the place. They have all the momentum. You you don't. Uh, but Florida State found a way. So good for them, man. That's a that's a really good win. And in March, it might be a really really big win for them. Picture it: gold helmets, gold pants, turquoise jerseys. Oh yeah, I'd like that more than the the black stuff they do. I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. being serious. Yeah, it's a good look. I like it. I think it'd be really. I like sharp. the turquoise. Yeah. I'm so I'm. You know, for all we know, next year the the player, the football players will just change the colors to turquoise and garnet, <laughs> turquoise and gold. Turquoise and gold. Be as, all right. If they have as much control of the program as we're led to believe, they right. might just say, you know what, 
It's not guarded in gold anymore. It's turquoise and gold. And to my point earlier, just seeing like John Thrasher get that psyched about a basketball game in November. At 11.30 at night. This leads you to believe that if this football team doesn't get cranking. He's, he's, gonna, you know, he's vested. He is, man. He is vested and invested in uh, in this program. He will not sit idly by for three or four years while if FSU, uh, you know, Puttering around the uh, landscape of college just athletics. Mired in mediocrity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know I lied and said we're going to go out on that funny little phone call that we had. Do you want to share anything with the folks? I know you're sick. Um, I mean, folks, he's battling some bad sinus throat congestion. Just a throat thing that's really bothersome. The yeah, old you're uvula, talking. little swollen uvula. Oh, that's that the worst. really bums me out right that's now. That's a little hangy ball thing in the back yeah, of your throat, kids. it's awful. So that's not fun. But I'm doing my best, gang. I'm doing my best because they don't make it much tougher than this guy. This is going to be your first December in, in 10 years without a football team to cover. And whether it's prep team making it to the uh, no, state championship. No, before that, it's like because back when I was doing preps, I mean, that would last until the middle of December. Yeah. So, yeah, this will be my first December ever as a journalist not covering a team or covering football games. How should we turn the page to what's going to be a long December? Is there reason to believe maybe this, this year? This year will be better than the last? I, I think so, buddy. I think, well – this year was not better than the last. Clearly. I think next year will be better than the last. Okay. There you go. He's Corey Maslow. Thanks for listening, folks.